Okay, we are live. Hello, everyone out on YouTube. I am Sleepy Reader, aka Damien, and I'm here with Matt, who Hello. you may vaguely remember as Wednesday Serial. Okay, oh, yeah. on YouTube. So. I did a video not too long ago. Endlessly about Green Lantern. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we are recording a session of uh, the Never Stay Dead podcast, which will be starting up in a minute or two. Um, I just need to fiddle with my windows again. And um, I am drinking Lagunitas Hazy Wonder. Oh. Which I think might be new. I don't know. I used to just get regular Lagunitas IPA. Um, and I still have trouble believing uh, beer in cans is as good as beer in bottles. Which I'm told by my beer expert friends they've now made it. Now all the fancy beers come in cans, and they've now made the can technology as good as bottles. I think you're supposed to pour it in a glass. No, no, no. That's. That's for the, uh, what do you call them? The uh, people who know what they're doing? The stuck up elite who need glasses to drink their beer. I need glasses to see, so I'll just, you know, write it out. Although, actually, I do have a actual reason for not liking to put beer in glasses, which is the um, carbonation stays longer inside the can or bottle, in my opinion. Like, once you pour it into the glass, it kind of just all flows out, all the carbonation, very quickly. <clears throat> That's the one thing I've learned in my 59 years now. I turned 59 a few days ago, or a few weeks ago. Congratulations. Yes. Is that the same age as your one. dad? I think I'm probably the same age as your dad. He's older. Oh, OK. So he probably knows even more about drinking beer than I do. I mean, he knows to pour in a glass. <laughs> well, then maybe he's kind of a loser. No <laughs> offense. <laughs> I'll let him know. Does he? he I, I kind of hope he doesn't know of my existence. <laughs> I don't really think so. I mean, you've been mentioned. Uh -huh. Certainly my relatives have absolutely no interest in my comic book social life. So I don't even bother anymore. There you go. Other than my daughter, who, of course, is fascinated. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to start up the actual show. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Never Stay Dead. We are back. I am Damien, and I'm here with my old buddy, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hello. And today, uh, we're discussing my pick, which was Five issues of the Tomb of Dracula, kind of the old 70s Tomb of Dracula by Marv Wolfman, Gene Colan, and their inker, uh, Tom Palmer, who I consider important to the look of the book, too. Um, and I it's 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 legendarily a famous Marvel 70s horror series. And it's the longest running one. It went for 70 issues. And okay we just randomly picked some issues. So I picked to start with issue 24 and end with issue 28. Um, there aren't story arcs per se, but the last three issues of that have kind of a story that begins and ends. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you, Matt, for being putting up with another Bronze Age comic. I know that can be dicey. Well, this was... This was a very interesting uh, chunk to be pulling on. So, yeah, I think when I was flipping through my omnibus, it looked interesting when I saw what looked like a variety of stories and characters. In fact, before I um, before I try to um, sum up some of the storylines, I, I was immediately struck by the variety of characters and the variety of ethnicities and. Um, it's not an all male cast by far. Um, so I thought that was very interesting because I hadn't thought about that before. People think 
in the seventies, Marvel comics would be all white. Yeah, no, I noticed that. I mean, uh, just in our brief little bit here, I mean, we see a number of black characters. We see Muslim characters. Uh, we get a pretty good breath. I mean, a lot of the main characters are right. still white, but and and for three issues, the main character is very Jewish. Like he goes, he's a yeshiva student or whatever they call him. Yeah, and he wears a yarmulke. And that's like a major part of his identity, which again is not something you even see today in comics very much. Yeah, no, it was actually really interesting to see the like push of diversity and whatnot, which isn't how anyone was think of it, thinking of it right now. Right. It was doubly weird to me because this is the Tomb of Dracula, the comic I was ex not expecting to have diversity at all, and I would have even you know batted not. Right. And I think it was just, I mean, I just assume it was not like. Marv Wolfman saying we need more diversity in our horror comics. I think it was just his way of making an interesting comic by having a diverse cast of characters involved. Well, and as you kind of pointed to already, the diversity in a lot of ways comes down to kind of religious or cultural aspects that play off the Dracula and vampire mythos that we're used to. Right, by right. bending around with these characters existing in a larger world, uh, he's really building out the mythos and making it more interesting for that. And I thought that was one of the more interesting components, even if I couldn't quite dial in on everything. Right. Yeah, I think over, you know, again, see, the thing is, other than these four issues and an issue of Blade, I mean, the, the issue, the first issue of Dracula 10, the first issue of Dracula where Blade shows up, number 10, which mm -hmm. I also read recently. I haven't read any of these in 30 or more years. So it's it's all kind of a blur of, a positive blur in my memory. Um, but, but I think that, that he always was constantly trying to expand the character, expand the cast and have different times. I, I remember distinctly later, he adds an extremely nerdy character, which was also something you didn't normally see in a comic book in the 70s. Uh, I th and I think if I remember correctly, the extremely nerdy character wrote romance novels for a living. But so there's just all kinds of weird quirks and stuff. Yeah, no, um, th there is a lot of interesting things in here one thing that threw me though is we're looking at issues like you said 24 through 28 and i think every issue at one point references issue number one. Oh, really yeah uh, you're probably right and so um i'm coming into this cold i've never read tomb of dracula it's a weird kind of cold though because i mean i know about vampires i know about dracula i know about van helsing right uh, but I don't know it in the context of Marvel and this story especially. And right. so whereas not every issue builds forward the exact same momentum, it seems like there's been tracks that we kind of have been curving around and building up to. And there is a big event that happens, it seems, in issue 23. And then Apparently, yes. This is like taking everything that had been building up to that point and now bringing everything together. And... I hadn't read anything that came before. So I'm trying to make heads or tails of this whole thing. And so. Right. It's kind of a tapestry with all right. these threads. So I guess ideally, maybe I should have said, let's start with Dracula number one. My memory was that this comic didn't get very good for the first six or seven issues. Mm -hmm. um, even though everything builds on issue one where this, um, uh, descendant of Dracula, Frank Drake, and some friends go to the castle, to Dracula's castle in Transylvania, and accidentally bring him back to life by finding his body in the um, in the tomb and pulling pulling the uh, the stake out of the skeleton, and he comes back to life, and that sets things into motion. Uh, and so for a while, that character, Frank Drake, is our central character. And then other people start joining him, these other vampire hunters. And maybe you know this about the lore, because I know there's some other vampires, but Dracula is basically impossible to kill 
And like you're saying, they be, like he's right. basically being held at bay. He's not even killed with the stake in his heart. That's not. That's only true for Dracula, right? Well, that's that. The core flaw of this, I think, is the vagueness of the nature of Dracula. And yeah. I felt we experienced that in these issues. And I actually read the issue afterwards. I I read twenty nine and thirty. Cheater. Sorry about that. It's all good. <laughs> but in those even more, he seemed to be a bit more of a human being, but he, but also evil and ultimately egotistical, I think. Okay. But, but other times he just seems like an evil god, right? He, he can control people's mind. He can turn into smoke. He kills people. He controls all the other vampires. Mm -hmm. um, in my memory, it seems like he has vampires he controls, but then there's other vampires who control other vampires, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, that can make sense, right? Like, it's a hierarchy, but Dracula's top vampire, obviously. And then... Yeah, so there are times here in these issues we read, he his goal seems to just to kind of make it easy, make life easier for him to just suck blood wherever he wants and have less pesky, troublesome humans around to bother him yeah and to but also I mean, we should dive into individual issues but also yeah. there is a thread of the typical you know like getting the infinity gauntlet or whatever there's this MacGuffin called the chimera that apparently will give him some kind of incredible power over reality but that's never very clear either right okay so so we, let yeah uh, shall we talk about issue 27 i mean sorry 24 a little bit yeah let's and then talk we'll move on to other issues so issue 24 is kind of a apparently a resting point in a sense after a big series of issues where um where uh where dracula fought somebody named dr sun and was thought to be killed by him by our regular cast of characters so now they're all going off separately. Their their main goal in life is is completed, and they're 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 going off to do different things, right? Um, and and the so we in this in this issue we see uh, some of the characters go away. Like Frank Drake goes off and kisses goodbye. Rachel is it Rachel Van Helsing? Yeah, Rachel yep. Van Helsing, and then. Um, and then we see the Indian character Taj uh, right. have gone back to India, or maybe it's Pakistan, I'm not sure. And he seems to be a Sikh, I think. That's why he wears a turban. That's what I assume. Um, <clears throat> which is neither Muslim nor Hindu, but people get confused by that. And then we see Blade is kind of settling down with his lady in his apartment in London. And which that threw me off. Blade's design is not like I've seen Blade before, and uh -huh. it's not cool looking. Well, it must have seemed cool in the seventies. <laughs> He's based on a kind of a black exploitation kind of seventies black exploitation fighting hero, and he uses that kind of corny black exploitation dialogue. Well, I mean that's his whole character, right? Right. Yeah. And also, you know, I think a lot of comics through the 70s were still very influenced by pulp comics. And he almost sure. seems like a character out of Doc Savage or something, you know, like he has his puffy pants tucked into his boots. And yeah, so I'd, <laughs> I, I can see why you would be confused. To me, this is what Blade always looked like because because I read so many of these issues with him. Right. You know, I mean, this is right. what he did. He had a totally like. different look in the movies. And I didn't really follow him in the 90s in the, much in the comics he was in then. So I don't know what he looked like there. Gotcha. But I think then the, the main quote story in this issue, which as I said is kind of a resting issue to some degree, is after Blade takes care of a random vampire who's come to kill him and his girlfriend. Uh, a friend of theirs who apparently is a stripper somewhere in London comes right. to them for help because Dracula has been stalking her, kind of half vampire, half just dirty old man following her outside of the strip club. 
And then Blade has a big fight with Dracula that's inconclusive. And that's pretty much the whole issue, I think. Well, this the lots of sorry, go ahead. The stripper character, Trudy, it was interesting to kind of see how they were playing with it because, I mean, it's a lot of dancing around the code and, you know, what they can get away with saying because, you know, she's a dancer, right? But there's a lot of signals, right? And, I mean, they're they're doing a lot to, like, push the boundaries here, which I bet is part of why people love this comic and have such a fond remembrance. I mean, like, she's she's in her you know lingerie or whatever right. like running down the street and doing that so it's that kind of cornball horror move but it, it's kind of funny to see that like cheesy corny tacky stuff amidst all this dialogue and all this other stuff going on so you know right. they're playing highbrow lowbrow at the same time it's an interesting little give and take but it doesn't feel like it amounts to much by the end right my take on it is Marv Wolfman is embedding within his story a more standard horror story, which builds up a lot with a lot of writing, you know, about the slow dread as this creepy guy from the strip club reveals himself to be more and more awful. Mm-hmm. Um, even though, you know, we as readers probably already, most of us already know how awful he is and stuff. But I guess if you're a first time reader, the, the feeling of dread might build up. Mm-hmm. And then combining it with a Marvel, a more old-fashioned Marvel comic with a big fight scene um, between, right. between um, Blade and Dracula. And then with the other Marvel aspect, which is the threads of the ongoing soap opera, which includes this character Taj and his uh, wife who has no legs and the fact that they have been separated for five years and there's some horrible secret between them that makes them hate each other. Um, maybe because he hits her right he hits her which is also kind of shocking from a current perspective to see a man hit a woman I mean and but a man hit a woman and he's the hero and there's no bad consequences for him hitting her I guess that's what I mean yeah well what's she gonna do Uh, (laughs) I mean I know that's how things work in Colorado but right uh, people like to pretend it doesn't work that way anymore (laughs) um one thing that threw me off too, which isn't in your digital version, I doubt it was in your Nimbus either, is at the bottom of some pages, they'll just have something like Thor and Hercules and search of the living planet called Ego, or right. you know, just these little text ads. They did comics. that throughout the 70s in comics, or throughout a large chunk of the 70s. The first one I saw was, it's like advertising the death of Gwen Stacy comic. Mm-hmm. It's like the goblins there and Gwen's in peril or something. (laughs) And I'm sitting there and in my mind, this is an editor's note that this is referencing something else. So I read that page 10 times being like, what does this have to do with Spider-Man? This is my end. And no. We're Matt. (laughs) You know, what's interesting. If you Matt fraction briefly did a defenders run and throughout Uh that he had fake little bottom blurbs in the comic throughout ironically reflecting on on that's cool but yeah those things used to drive me crazy as a kid when i was reading reading comics they were very distracting yes but i guess they thought it was a clever way to promote their other comics i mean costs about nothing and it's right there yeah right and that emphasizes how long ago these comics were you know, that Gwen Stacy was dying at the same time as one of these issues happened. Yeah, I mean, this is 70s. Like, this yes. is... I was probably 12 when these p- comics were published. And as I mentioned off air, I turned 59 recently. Congratulations. But uh, no, there's no congratulations needed. <laughs> it just happens to you. You don't do I mean, achieve it. You're young for one more year. I know. And then I'm a senior citizen, right? <laughs> And everyone will treat me with deference. Don't they already? <clears throat> Only on YouTube. Oh, okay. And Twitter, of course. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so let's maybe skip on to the next issue after that. Yeah, twenty-five. Do you have any other thoughts from this? 
No, 25 was interesting. I think it was the most coherent single issue of the bunch that we went through. And it was a true standalone. Mostly. Yeah. Did it have a, I can't even remember now. I mean, there's some threads throughout, right? Cause it has to. Right. But, but it had a story, I think of a character who's making his first appearance here and is not part of our group of fearless vampire hunters yet. Right. And he, he, this is his first appearance. I'm saying that without looking it up because there's a twist at the end. And if you already knew. Right. Been... Right. A twist, which I'm assuming you figured out before we got to the very end. Right? I, I, honestly, I didn't figure it out before I got to the very end. But when I got to the very end, I was like, uh, I guess that makes sense. But it didn't really hit me. Uh, right. So this um, woman comes to Mr. King, who's a P.I., time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, her husband's just been killed, you know, on their honeymoon in London. And she's looking for a PI to help her, you know, I mean, guess catch the right. killer. But and he is he is narrating the story in classic film noir style. Right. Caption boxes. Which makes this a fun kind of like Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips kind of comic almost. Almost, yeah. Um, but I mean, here we have it. Here's the PI who's the white guy, but then it's this black couple who is married, and um, her husband was this accountant, and Dracula comes and kills her. Kills uh, him. Or kills him, I should say. Yes. On their uh, wedding night, I think. I thought it was their honeymoon. Or right? honeymoon. Yeah. I mean, You're right, it was their honeymoon. Yeah. I still thought, oh, this is more classic horror movie things where you get killed on your honeymoon. or your Right. Wedding. And they are African, well, they are African characters or African British characters, I guess. But there's no African American in their race, and they don't speak like they're from a black exploitation movie, unlike Blade, which I found interesting since I thought, well, maybe Marv Wolfman thought all black people talk that way, but I guess it's just Blade. Well, and that work, I mean, Blade's an action hero, right? Like, that right, works. Right. But he then... comes out of that world. Yeah, these are just everyday folk. Um, but right. yeah, except this guy took a job curating Dracula's funds, which led him to know where certain things were. So Dracula had to kill him. Right. He was an accountant who knew too much of Dracula's business. It's like Dracula, get, get your. But he decided over. not to kill his wife. Or no, he was going to kill her, but then some witnesses showed up, so he runs away, which is kind of typical for all these stories. The the things that foil Dracula sometimes seem a little weak, given how powerful he's generally shown to be. Right. But anyway, uh, people show up, and that causes him to run away. And now she uh, wants Hannibal King to solve her solve her husband's murder, right? Right. Um, so, you know, they go through the rigmarole, I guess. I mean, I, just cause I don't want to dive no. through a lot of the details of the issue. Um, he goes, he, he, I forget when he says he's, he, sh there's a flashback where he's witnessed vampires at work. And so he suspects that this has to do with vampires. And right. there's a whole scene where he goes to a bar and asks questions and people don't want to answer him. And someone tries to beat him up, and that leads to more clues. So yeah, it's very much in the tradition that Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips work in, in Criminal. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely a similarity between uh, Gene Colan's artwork and Sean Phillips' artwork, I think. That's fair. I mean, the coloring is way different. Well, yeah. Guy, I mean, but... There's the coloring done yeah. back when they only had 64 colors to work with. <sighs> Slackers. Uh... <laughs> Indeed. But uh, here, I mean, not too far from where you are, I believe, um, we end up at the docks and uh, basically they throw him into a bunch of wood crates and he's able to use the debris as a stake to take care of the... Right. Dracula the has a bunch of his vampire slaves attack him. Yeah. Which it's interesting in hindsight that he's able to just do that, but... Okay. Right. And then before Dracula can kill him, it turns out he has called the police or set off a police alarm. 
Right. So since the police are coming, Dracula decides he better get out of there. Right. Um, Dracula can't deal with the fuzz. Yes. And somewhere in there, it's revealed that he's Dracula knows he's a vampire. Right. And I guess the interesting thing shown here is, uh, well, two things that become interesting for future issues, not ones that we read tonight, but um, that there are other vampires. Occasionally there are vampires who are not evil somehow. And occasionally, um, and there are vampires who don't have to obey Dracula. Because at times it seems like all Drac vampires have to obey him. Well, I think it's because any vampire he sires or his but sire no sires yeah. yeah, are there. But if it's separate, I mean, but then how far down the bloodline does it have to go? I don't know. But <laughs> I, I think that's the idea. I, it's it's an interesting idea, but when you realize he's a vampire, he but he doesn't have the bloodlust idea, right? He doesn't seem inherently evil, so it's just kind of like, Oh, so he's a PI who's a vampire. Right. Okay. Like, it just, it doesn't really mean much by the time it's all said and done. And and it kind of goes back to the old, old horror stories with the, the twist that only seems clever to a 12 year old, probably. Right. But just hindsight, knowing that this guy then becomes part of the regular crew of people opposing Dracula. Uh, throughout the weave of the issues, the weave of the tapestry makes this more interesting for me. Right. But it does, it does show, I think again, my basic theory that, that Wolfman was trying to meld the old horror comics with the Marvel way of doing comics at the same time. And this one was more like an old fashioned one with less super pseudo superheroics and such. Mm. <clears throat> So then um, I think then the last three are oops, this uh, story about the chimera, which I believe is a real Greek myth. But in this case, it's a statue that was created, you know, before Conan existed <laughs> and King Call by some wizard and has been uh, separated into three pieces. And if you could put all three pieces back together, some horrible, powerful magic could be uh, brought to life. And and it centers around uh, this religious Jewish young man's adventures after his father, who's collected the pieces of the chimera, gets killed. And different parties, some of whom we never learn who they are, are chasing after trying to put steal the different pieces of the chimera from each other, including Dracula, and some of his henchmen, including his lover, who he sent out to go sleep with this young Jewish boy to help get <laughs> and romance him to have, help get the uh, piece of the chimera from him. Yeah. So that's my really quick summary of it. Yeah. Um, there's a few interesting bits in here that's interesting because we're dealing with these new characters we've come off these other characters but we get some of the cast from before uh falling in line eventually right although some um, of them just as delusions of dracula's right uh, it's a this is a hard comic to follow <laughs> i'm sorry no it, it's fine um i i i, I was very I aware. researched more and really found some like a five issue group that was more solid. And I just, cause I was looking at it visually and it looked like it was solid, but it, it really wasn't. Well, I was just a keenly aware the entire time I was going through this, that this was interesting. I mean, this is definitely a Marvel comic. This is definitely kind of written in a way that I'm used to things being written and whatnot, but it was so hard for me to access so much because I didn't know any of the characters. I didn't kind of know the setup or the lay of the land. And so it was a lot harder for me to grasp onto things and whatnot. It was very, it, it was weird reading a Marvel comic that was harder to access. And it kind of took me back to where I'm so used to things, but imagining picking up a Spider-Man comic and trying to make heads or tails of a number of things with so much that I know so innately, it, it, it's good to kind of 
get that in your system every now and again. Right. Although, you know, because recently we read some early uh, Claremont X-Men that wasn't too much later than this. Mm -hmm. But he does much, he works much harder to make every issue accessible. Well, Marv Wolfman didn't do as much in terms of the tagging characters and giving their backstory quickly on things. I wouldn't even hand that to Claremont, especially at that point in the run, though, because, I mean, he's essentially reestablishing or introducing characters. So, you know, he's really only had a handful in, whereas here we're, you know. Well, we're 20 and a half. So, yeah. So. Or maybe close to, you know, 25, 25, 30 issues. In. Yeah, we're almost three decades you know, yeah. or three years in, not three decades, three years in into a run um, with this contiguous story. So I don't know. It, it was just interesting to go through. Um, the only thing that really stood out to me in this uh, issue was the cliffhanger. So I don't want to just jump to that if you had anything else. Um, you know, the three issues are kind of a blur to me. I found... <clears throat> What struck me is this uh, character, what was her name? Uh, was it Jessica something? Who, because uh, she kind of evolves into the central, who befriends the guy, David, who's the, the Jewish, I presume like a 20 year old Jewish college student age guy um, and becomes kind of his lover to get, but she's actually working for Dracula. But she loves Dracula. And Dracula may or may not kind of love her. Um, but it was, her characterization was very weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas this comic does a lot of good stuff for, you know, reach and ideas. There's some clunky writing. There's some odd moments. There's some, it felt like not enough notes were passed between the author and the artist to kind of make a coherent whole just kind of jumps from time to time or yeah. like there, there are even moments where I feel like um, Marv Wolfman wrote, you know, they, they used to do a plot and then the artist would draw it however he wanted. And then you would write the dialogue and the caption boxes. Sometimes I thought Marv Wolfman wrote part of this issue one day and then forgot exactly what he said on a few pages ago and then says something slightly contradictory to it. Mm. pages later yeah like for instance uh <clears throat> they say the three pieces of the chimera have never been put together but if you put them together you would have this incredible power i think we saw david's father put together the chimera and then people come into the shop and easily kill him he had no power at all but then later if once it's put together you have incredible power Whatever that power is, it's hard to say. Maybe it just needs a minute to boot up, you know. <laughs> maybe. But it felt like maybe uh, that's just one example. There were there were other things. Um and here's what this this hit me for a number of reasons. The cliffhanger here is that they trap Dracula in this basement and it's completely surrounded by metal walls, yeah. And the only way for him to get out is through this pouring of holy water. So he can't just sit right. there and drown. But then he turns, I guess it goes to the next issue, but he turns right. into a bat and he flies out. He turns into a bat. And then at the last minute, as he gets to the top of the ceiling, he turns into mist. So he has the ability to turn into mist. Which is okay. he can get out of any situation just about. <laughs> Yeah, I just, this hit me as such a thing. Like, even if he's missed, he has to go through the holy water, right? Or maybe he... I, the idea was there was enough space between the holy water and the pipe, the side of the pipe on one side that he could go through. But then why do you need to turn into bad in the first place? I don't know. And he comes out and he's yeah. screaming and in pain. So... Right. So he, suppose, I think the idea is as missed, he mostly was able to get past the holy water safely, but... He brushed against it here and there, and it caused him burning pain. Okay, uh, but then he's roughly fine. I don't know. It just right, and then he passes out in whatever room is above the um, the trap he was in. But no one ever comes along to capture her, him, or anything. This uh, powerful enemy. 
who's never named. Yeah. I, it's just funny because he, he's such a Marvel character here. You know, there's pain, there's strife or whatever, but right. he can't be killed. He can't really be stopped or damaged. He's just this force that keeps going. Right. Uh, but because so much of the story is about trying to stop him, his ability to deal with this in a pretty weaselly way just kind of really it cuts the right. It was one of those fake cliffhangers where, you know, someone's well, hanging from a cliff and then the next issue you see there's a branch right below them that's going to catch them. <laughs> well, but what's what was interesting to me is it's framed like a normal Marvel cliffhanger too. So right. Dracula's in trouble. How is he going to get out? But he's the villain. But it's right. kind of interesting that's inversion of the normal Marvel thing where he's basically the hero. And then all these people are trying to get him, and uh, but he he's the solo star, and so it was just this weird way. And this continues through these few issues where it's written around the idea that you're worried about the progress of Dracula and whatnot, but you should be rooting <laughs> for him to be stopped. And so it just it really jerked my ability to be like, why why would I care? If, like I hope Dracula gets stopped. I care, but like. I don't like him. I, I want him to get dead. So, right. I mean, at the end of that ish of um, of this issue with the holy water coming in, I'm like, oh, cool. Dracula is going to be offed by holy water. Not thinking, oh, that means there'll be no more comics about him. <laughs> right. So it's it's this weird dichotomy of you're rooting for Dracula to die, but of course, their fun would end if Dracula does die. Mm -hmm. And and the way. The way Marv Wolfman seemed to successfully keep this going for 70 issues was, was by making this sort of soap opera tapestry of all the characters so that Dracula's not always your focus. Right. And, and you can sometimes uh, root against Dracula and occasionally Dracula has some human feelings and then you feel a little bit for him. But then it goes away again when he's when he needs to be just the devil. He is just the devil. Yeah. So, and ultimately, I don't know which issue it happens in, but ultimately, Dracula and our um, Jewish hero and our and the girl who loves Dracula, but maybe now loves the hero who she was sent to seduce, mm -hmm. are all captured by this mysterious other villain um i think maybe it's dr sun but i don't even remember who dr sun is but i want to think that maybe dr sun was an oriental asian villain and that we saw asian soldiers working for him okay or for whoever it was anyway they all get captured oh, and stop here you want me to stop? Oh, it was fun having uh, him use the Star of David to fight against Dracula. Is that why you? Well, for those that... listening on audio, I'm flipping through digital versions on screen of these issues. But what really got me there is this is really big for the mythos idea. Um, and he speaks directly to it. Like, it's a symbol of faith, so it will hurt him. Right. But it's not going to hurt him as much as a cross. But it's this idea that, like, oh, any symbol of faith can repel vampires. Mm -hmm. And I, there's a lot of play with that in, you know, vampire mythology or whatever. But I just thought this was a really constructive way to work around the idea that there are these monsters and that they're not going to just be repelled by a single religion. It actually really does a lot to bring things together. And it's, it's not a small touch. Like this is a big deal to the comic, I believe. So I just thought that moment. Yeah. In particular I mean, philosophically, I think that comes up several times just in these issues where he's, he's kind of against hope, against faith, against anything, but, uh, pure selfish avarice of a sort, not avarice in terms of money, but avarice in terms of uh, appeasing your most base instincts. Here, here. And yes, as we drink beer, we, we agree with you, Dracula. Although I don't think he drinks beer. Are you drinking beer? No. I'm drinking uh, honey whiskey. Oh, you're, you're, you drink the hard stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I thought that was a cool scene. It Again, I'm always bothered by sometimes Dracula can be stopped more easily than other times. Why right. can't he just continuously fight off Dracula? Well, with, sometimes Dracula... Well, he can gets totally tired. defeat Dracula with, by just continually pressing that that uh, um, Star of David in his face. Um, but then he semi-beats him, and then some people with guns come along and capture them all. Right. And why can't Dracula, when faced with the Star of David, just turn into mist and get out of the way? I don't know. Maybe, maybe when you press that sign of faith into him, his power to shape change, amongst other things, goes away, along with his strength. Maybe. So our other unnamed bad guy captures them all and is able to put together the, the entirety of the chimera. As we're flipping through the digital pages here, I'm skipping over parts that are just part of Taj's story, which um, inch along a little bit in this issue, you know, him making up with his wife and stuff, and the revelation that his son is a vampire. Which, that was creepy. Yeah, I mean, I want more of that story, and we will eventually get it if we keep reading all 70 issues. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but then the main thrust of the story is um, Dracula and the girlfriend and David are all captives by whoever this other evil person is who has lackeys, but we never see the evil person just hear their voice or evil entity. Yeah. I and, assume it's Igor. Right. And and Igor then has the entire entire chimera. And while Dracula used just the tail of the chimera to call flames down from the sky, whoever this is uses the chimera to give people delusions of, I guess, their greatest fears and things like that mm -hmm. and to manipulate their minds. So that happens to David and then it happens to... Um, what is her name? Is it Jessica? I, that sounds right. Um, it happens to Jessica, and and then it happens to Dracula. Each of them is given their own greatest fear, but Dracula breaks through the illusion eventually, and um, and then the bad guy flees, <laughs> with, uh, remaining invisible. Uh, as Dracula breaks through the wall, he's gone. And all that's left are his Asian-looking soldiers who argue amongst themselves whether it's worth fighting against Dracula now that their master is gone. Yeah, probably not. And then Dracula uses his power. I don't think it comes from the Chimera, but maybe to cause someone to... I think he just uses his own hypnotic powers to cause one of the evil women henchmen to kill herself rather than to kill Jessica. <clears throat> And then Dracula grabs hold of the chimera and is kind of stroking it. And, you know, he says, oh, her name is Sheila. I'm sorry. It's time to leave now, Sheila. Come. Together we shall prepare for my incoming victory. And she just grabs the chimera out of his hand. She's just a normal woman. Grabs the chimera out of his hands and smashes it against the wall. And that's the end of it. Which I thought was strange. Like, it's, is it so easy to grab something away from Dracula? I guess you could say he wasn't expecting her to do it because she's his girlfriend. Yeah. But and then Sheila and David leave Dracula defeated because Sheila has turned against him. He doesn't try to do anything to them. Um, oh, he's tuckered out again. He's kind of heartbroken. There is kind of references throughout here that his powers have been fading, and that's why he wants the Chimera. Although it never seemed like his powers were actually fading. Yeah. So overall, I like the, uh, I'm sorry, I'll let you say your summary or whatever, or other comments, but my overall feeling about this now is I like a lot of the possibilities involved here, but this was much more sort of crazy, well, as you said, kind of confusing and inconsistent and 
uh, sloppy kind of writing and storytelling than I had expected from my glowing memories of this series. I think that happens with a lot of our favorites that we return to sometimes. But I mean, as much as th there are some details that get lost or hard to chew through, because I mean, this is a wordy comic. Uh, I, I thought there's a lot of interesting elements. It, it's interesting because they layer in so much but it's nothing that particularly compels me to want to read more because this just isn't my wheelhouse at the end of the day right and i think i will read more and as i said i skipped ahead and read the next two issues and they were a bit tighter especially i can't remember if it's the very next issue or the issue afterwards where dracula can't enjoy drinking blood of any other woman because he misses Sheila so much <laughs> and he's just dying to kill her to get his revenge. And then, um, and then David goes and tries to kill Dracula, but makes the classic mistake of waiting till, till sundown to go into his castle to try to kill him. So uh, Dracula kind of toys with him and then follows him home to the apartment of that he and Sheila have been living in. And, um, and she stupidly invites him in, apparently did not know about that uh, protection against him. You know, if you, uh, one of the common vampire things, which is true in this comic is a vampire can't come into your home unless you invite them. In. Mm -hmm. um, she invites him in and then he, I think he alternately threatens to kill her and asks her, he says, well, you can just come back with me and we'll go back to the way we were. And she throws herself out the window and kills herself. And he is defeated that way. And that was a very tight issue. And in that one, Dracula seemed like a monster with some humanity. Um, but it's also twisted by his selfish evilness that he doesn't understand how, how love and things like that really work. It's a good blend. And what was interesting going through with all the stuff we've talked about so far is just remembering that like even Marvel comics used to have more of a diverse plate that you could go pick up. Right. Like, there's nothing like this anymore. Certainly not even for Marvel. And it's kind of cooler to think of comics to be a bit more diverse, even if it's not your thing, knowing that the stuff that you like is a bit right. more special for being different from something like this. Well, and so, you know, that comes my down downerness on the Bronze Age Marvel and its sloppiness is countered by the fact that they were willing, they were letting writers do kind of what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, all the writers from back then say, you know, I can't work with the way the comics industry works now because the editors control everything. Back then, they said, you know, you gave them an idea of how you wanted to do Dracula and then they just let you do what you want and give you your leash, let you off the leash for a while and, and see how it does. Um, and that, that was true also with Chris Claremont. I've heard him in interviews say, you know, that's why the, the X-Men succeeded for him because they let him do what he, what his creative impulses told him to do. Yeah. But, um, but it was, I think it was also chaos. It was all these young fans who were suddenly professionals trying to be editors and trying to be writers. And um, there weren't many adults in the house. <laughs> they may be needed better editors. Um, and I mean, I think you can see where a balance could be pretty easily struck between yes. these things to get a much better through line, you know, allow some creative output, allow mm -hmm. people to do something crazy and new just because it's crazy and new. But then issue by issue you want to rein it in a bit to be like okay these pages are, don't go anywhere or like these panels are in conflict with each other you need to tighten this up but the overall direction and flow you know let it be creative yeah yeah and um i don't know i i, I may also find if i keep plowing through this that that it does start to shape up to something closer to the wonderful comic that I have in my memory. 
I, you're far from the only person to have a lot of fond memories of this series. So yeah, no, it's a kind of a cliche of Bronze Age readers that Dracula was one of the best comics. Yeah, I think we just hit this part where um, the story needed some quiet time and it didn't quite fully take it. But it sounded like they kind of moved through one phase, they're moving to the next, and he maybe didn't quite know where to go yet. And so it was this weird trunk. But like that single issue we had, that was tight and that was a lot more fun. Right. Um, and then the Chimera might have been a weaker point, but I mean, that was three issues and then we just finished it. And then. Right. Yeah. And maybe if we'd read some of the issues before about Sheila, we would have understood her motivation better. Right. Um, or maybe the motivation would have been a mess. <laughs> um, one thing give it the better thing was that. that I noticed as I was doing going through the omnibus, they have slipped in here all the um, giant size Draculas. Remember we talked about how the giant size X Men was part of a series of giant size comics they were doing for a while, right? Quarterly, and so the quarterly giant size uh, Draculas were written by Chris Claremont. So it'll be interesting to read those and see how his approach to all of this went. Now, he probably had to write in such a way that he didn't interfere with the continuity of, of the regular series, I assume. Although maybe so kind of like different. annuals. Kind of, but four times a year. So, um, Well, yeah, but I mean, like, that idea of, like, you know, it's taking the rough idea of the status quo, but then telling the standalone story. Oh, right, right. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's kind of how it had to be. Um, um, and I know there was, I forget who it technically belongs to, but there was a giant size Spider-Man and Dracula issue where they're both on this, uh, you know, cruiser boat and right. Dracula's causing some mischief and uh, Spider-Man's trying to deal with what's going on. And it's actually some thugs that are causing <laughs> some problem. And so Dracula deals with some of them and Spider-Man deals with some of them, but they never actually meet or interact. It's a, interesting little dance that they do in that comic one thing that did not disappoint my memory is uh the gene cullen tom palmer art oh yeah um, it just is pretty i mean it does a little bit resemble uh um, phillips's art right now sean phillips's art right now but it it's pretty unique art even for the bronze age i think at least to me it seems that way and well, it, it just takes, it's kind of sloppy in ways, but it also takes a lot of risks um, compared to, you know, drawing like John Buscema or Jack Kirby or something like that. Well, yeah, I think it's a lot more about the expressions of the characters um, than big flashy action. Because this, I mean, despite some of the stuff we talked about, a lot of this is talking heads and drama and whatnot. So you really need to sell the emotion of the scene more than you need to sell the action right. of it. Yeah, and it's a lot about um, atmosphere. Yeah. And um, right. anyway, I really enjoyed the art a lot. And to, <laughs> to tell you how strong my memories of this was, in my uh, two of my more expensive art pieces that I bought, original art pieces, are pages from um, Tomb of Dracula. Much later issues. I think the later issues are more a little more affordable when it comes to the original art. Mm, excuse me. Just burp some beer. Well, part of me is slightly disappointed you don't want to read more, but I'm not really surprised. <laughs> um, it Maybe is not in your wheelhouse. I've, I've never heard you talk about liking uh, horror and soap opera mixed together. I've just never been a big horror fan, though. I mean, I'll be honest, like I, I wouldn't be opposed to coming back to this at some point. I think a big block for me right now is I just um, got a huge block of comics of my own to get through. And right. So I'm kind of my headspace is elsewhere. Well, we are. I mean, we each have our own um, siren calls in comics that make it a little hard to switch to each other's reading habits. Right. I am, I've been currently been reading uh, Prince Valiant, which I assume would be lousy for us to do a podcast about, but that's what I've been enjoying. Yeah, Prince Valiant is a... I, 
I tried not reading enough. Kind of meaty thing that we could discuss, and not, at least not the two of us. Maybe I could discuss it on my own <laughs> at some point on my YouTube oh, yeah. channel. <clears throat> but it would be mostly about the art, I think. So, um, but you plowed through this enormous mountain of what would you call it? Copper Age Green Lantern? Oh, yeah. And well, now you're plunging on into basically the 90s Wolverine or 80s, 90s Wolverine? Well, no. So, you I got 200 on, issues or something? A lot of comics. Um, well, yeah. So, I recently um, bought the initial run of X Force. Um, the first real volume of Wolverine. I don't know if it's technically volume two because there's that four issue mini with Claire. Right. McCoy. I think it may technically be a volume two, but yeah, it's the first real ongoing. Um, right. Which is 189 issues, which I got most of in a go. Um, I'm missing a couple issues, though none of the big ones and a few annuals, but um, that's there. But what I'm currently reading is another partial recent acquisition which is going through the new mutants run um which was where i wanted us to steer our next episode and do and is this the new mutants written by is it louise simonson this is claremont claremont okay i simonson comes on eventually but that's not till later and then it's nikaza oh or okay. I did not pronounce that right. Which part are we reading? We're going to read together some for ne the next episode of Never Say Dead. Yeah, we're going to do the Demon Bear Saga, which is one of the highlights. And what that movie that's supposed to come out is going to be based on. But it's supposed to be a pretty good, tight uh, three issues, which I is thought it, would be good. Is it called the Dingleberry episode? Demon Bear. Demon Bear, okay. So this is part of the Chris Claremont era? Yeah. Okay. So it's really early New Mutants, but I thought it'd be fun to do something based on Claremont when he was in his throw, but it was in a different space. Also, I'm just going through New Mutants, so I thought it would be a fun. Which came came first, X Force or New Mutants? I'm thinking New Mutants, but oh, New Mutants goes, and then once Cable's introduced, they're pretty much on the road to becoming X Force, and then it's. X Force for a long time, then Mew Mutants pops up here and there. Oh, you know what? I have X Factor and X Force confused. Yeah, X Factor um, predates some. Uh, yeah, X Factor is a different uh, line. So X Factor, you haven't been collecting. Um, oh, I have all that. Because X Factor, if I remember, was then a group of the X Men of kind of the older X Men. So, so you had the X-Men who were the kind of the new X-Men, then you had the older X-Men, then you had the new mutants who were the very younger X-Men. Yeah, so the X-Factor is the 05, and then you have the new X-Men going for a while, um, which at that point you get Wolverine, Storm, Rogue, right. all that. We stopped thinking of them as the new X-Men. but Right. And then, yeah, new mutants is there. Um, so it's it's a lot of teams which is yeah. well and it's crazy to think that for a while it's all claremont mm -hmm. basically i guess not x factor but um is that I, what simonson was writing then maybe maybe is that maybe him simonson was writing x factor i don't know can't keep it all okay well i kind of look forward to it i i just like you don't have any impetus to read Dracula, I have no impetus to read uh, New Mutants or other spin-offs of the X-Men. But I'm sure it'll be interesting. So, yeah, uh, Louise Simonson takes over X-Factor at issue six, which is what the, the like most valuable issue of that run. And then he, he has a good long run. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, a lot of Walt Simonson on art. Right. They kept working as a couple on that. Um, okay. Well, that's great. We will be back because like Dracula, we never stay dead. There you go. Dracula fits in perfectly in this theme. Totally. He, he, in this series, it seems like he dies every four or five issues only to come back. Yeah.
never staying dead, but dying <laughs> regularly um, totally a marvel character i'm digging of course it. he's never alive he's undead which is a concept well, that i never quite wrap my head around but. you know i i could get behind i could try that there's dead alive and undead all right a little paler but i, I don't think that would bother me too much ah, well um i guess i will end the youtube broadcast and then we will ris whisper real secrets about things no one should know about. All right. Should I turn off my recording? Yeah. Okay.